me a call. Amen. Give me a call. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. The word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, meaning Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, I want to talk to us for a while on the topic, Give Me a Call. Father, once again, God, we come before the throne of grace, grateful for the presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel and have felt in the house of God today as we lifted up the name of Jesus and sang, the blessed songs of Zion. Master, in the name of Jesus, right now we loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We ask God that the Spirit of the Lord would rest upon us 
as I strive to deliver the word of God, Lord, I can do and say nothing that would benefit any hearer except for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. For the anointing makes my words real and alive and meaningful to the hearer. Touch the ear of every hearer. Touch the heart of every hearer. Let our heart today, O oh God, be cultivated and made ready to readily and gladly receive the word of God that it might spring forth and bring fruit in our lives unto true righteousness and true holiness. O oh God, today, how we need you, how we need you, how we need you. O oh Lord, touch every hearer. Touch us all, lift us up to a higher place in you than we've ever before known. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Give me a call. There's a tendency in human beings to worry and to fret and to try to reason our way out of every dilemma that we may have to face. But as children of God today, it's important that we learn to turn to the Lord in our troubles and not simply to trust in our own devices. Amen. Right. You would think that this would be an automatic response for a child of God, but all too often it is not. You would think that every born-again believer would know that when trouble comes, it's time to pray. Hallelujah. When trouble comes, it's time to call upon the name of the Lord. When trouble comes, it's time to seek the face of God. And yet, interestingly enough, I know from experience, I've told you before, before I came out and started affirming ministry, folks, I've pastored churches with hundreds of people. I know that's hard to believe nowadays with the huge audiences we draw. But, uh, you, you know, this ain't my first rodeo. And I'm here to tell you, I've had, an ex I've had experiences with a whole lot of people. I've had a lot of church members come to me and say, Oh, brother, this happened in my life. That happened in my life. I've lost my job. Or uh, they're threatening to take my car back. Or we received a notice on our house that we may be foreclosed on. And I'm thinking I'm, I need to get another job. I'm thinking I need to do this. I'm thinking I need... And boy, I mean to tell you, they're reasoning out. They're trying to figure out how to get themselves out of the hole. And I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, do they not realize that God is not a last ditch effort? God is not the last one we turn to. Prayer is not the last thing we turn to. It is the first thing, hallelujah, to come. Yeah. A believer knows that in time of trouble, it's time to look to God. Yes, amen. We're living in a circumstance right now, and everybody watching this, we're all affected. We're all in the same boat. There's a virus ravaging our planet, not just our country, but ravaging our planet. It's making many people deathly ill. It's taking many lives. It is overloading the hospital systems in country after country. And America is on the list. Very soon things may well be uh, more difficult for even our advanced hospital system here in the U.S. of A to handle. And yet there are people running around like chickens with their heads chopped off trying to figure out what can I do, what can I do, what can I do. Well now, first of all, let me tell you a little something. You need to act in wisdom. If there's anything I get tired of, it is Christian people acting stupid. Brother Ronnie, I hope you know me well enough to know I have a bad habit. I talk very plainly. I know it upsets the sensitivities of a lot of Christians because they're used to preachers who, you know, try to whitewash and soften everything. I don't tend to talk like that. It's just not my personality. But I get tired of people acting the fool and calling it faith. Acting stupid, folks, is not faith. 
Right. I remember when I was a kid, there was a man in the little town I grew up in, Beacon Falls, Connecticut, little tiny, tiny town in Connecticut. And we had a neighbor who had started coming to our church, the church I grew up in. And he came to the Lord and he found Jesus and he became very excited. And as happens with many people who first come to the Lord, he was overzealous and he operated in what we refer to as zeal without wisdom. Meaning, you know, you got all the fire in your belly you can handle, but you haven't got enough wisdom in your head to know how to handle it. And this man, who owned a little grocery downtown Beacon Falls where I grew up, this fella went to the local stream. We had, I'm trying to remember, uh, not Black Rock, but I, I can't even remember the name anymore. It's been so many years since I lived up home. But he went to this place where there was a little stream. And he took his jacket and he decided he was going to be like Elijah. And he was just going to smite that old stream with his jacket and command it to part. And he did, and he did, and he did, and he did. And all he wound up with was a wet jacket and a lot of people laughing at him. Okay, when health officials and government officials and scientists tell you that there is a virus ravaging the nation and that the best thing we can do to try to curb uh, the effects of this virus and to try to slow its movement through our population. When they tell you this and they advise you to stay at home and not get too close to other people and isolate socially, Christian, what you need to do is exactly what they've asked you to do. That's right. I saw a video on Facebook this week of a number of preachers, and many of them pastoring huge churches, big churches, with lots and lots of people. And they're telling their people, come to church anyway. Of course they want them to come to church anyway. You can't put anything in the offering plate if you're not where the offering plate passes. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie to you folks. That's what motivates a lot of these preachers. If it was an issue merely of feeding the flock of God, we got us a little HD video camera, we got us a little HD uh, camera for our for live, uh, you know, broadcasting. Uh, we're a little tiny church, don't have a lot of people and a lot of money, and yet every Sunday we broadcast on Facebook and on, uh, yeah, on Facebook and on uh, YouTube. So if it was a matter of merely feeding the flock of God, I got news for you. You can do that fairly easily. It's not real difficult. Matter of fact, these preachers, Tommy, wouldn't even have to leave their home. They could literally stand in their living room and they could deliver a word from the Lord to their congregation right from their living room if they had to. But oh no, they're going to get up and tell their people, Bless God, if we die, we die for Christ. Um, yeah. But what you also do is you show the world that you're a fool and that you lack wisdom right. and that you're not the least bit concerned for the health and well-being not only of your own congregation, but everybody with whom uh, members of your congregation may then come into contact. And I guarantee you, that a third or a quarter of those congregations are going to fall sick and they're going to wind up going through this and many people, most people who experience the coronavirus are going to survive it. They're going to get, some are going to become extremely ill, some are hardly going to become ill at all. But many of these people are going to grow very sick. The vast majority may survive it. There may be a couple that die. But how many people are going to then become infected because these people refuse to do what the public officials and the health officials and the government had asked them to do? I'm going to tell you something, folks. God's people ought to be operating above all else in wisdom. Your testimony goes down the toilet when you act like a fool and you act foolish. 
your testimony goes down the drain. People will not respect you. They will not admire you. They're not going to think, oh, look at his devotion. Why? What a devoted person. No. They're looking to say, why is that fool going and getting in a crowd of hundreds of people when health officials have said you're not to do that? And then if the government has to step in and if the police have to come in and say, oh, I'm sorry, but this assembly is too large. You're not allowed to. All of a sudden, they're going to be screaming that the church is being uh, tormented and you uh -huh. know and that's not the case that's not what's happening doesn't have anything to do with you being a church it, w it wouldn't make any difference if you were a, a sports assembly or if you were a motivational speaker having an assembly or if you were somebody trying to teach people how to buy and sell real estate <laughs> wouldn't matter but people have a habit when difficult times come, when trouble comes, as human beings we have a habit of running about to and fro, trying to figure our own way out of the dilemma. Well, I've got news for you. The Word of God says that the Lord causes this, His sun to shine upon the just and the unjust. He causes it to rain upon both the just and the unjust, what does that mean? That means that uh, natural occurrences which affect one person are going to affect the saved and the unsaved the same. Right. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden, because you're a child of God, that sickness will never touch you. It doesn't mean that because you're a child of God, that cancer will never touch you. It doesn't mean because you're a child of God, that diabetes will never touch you. It doesn't mean because you're a child of God, that as you grow older, your eyes won't grow dim. Or your bladder weak. Or your prostate enlarged. Got news for you, honey. Uh-uh. The same things that happen to older people uh, who are not Christians will happen to older people who are Christians. Amen. Amen. The same thing that touches the lives of the unbeliever is going to touch the life of the believer. Therefore, we need to use wisdom. Yes. I'm not up here telling people, you ought to be going to church regardless of whether or not the government says or health officials say. No, 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 quite the opposite. God's provided a means. There are technologies today. There are resources today that allow us to share the Word of God with you. Now, do I recommend you sit at home and do this when everything is good and when it is safe to, to, to be part of a church? No. It is far better to be part of the church than it is to try to get all of your spiritual needs met through technology. But under the circumstances, the technology is there. You know, you're able to be fed and to receive a word from God. God's people today often suffer with the world because we approach trouble in the same way that the world does. Huh. We approach trouble without God. We approach trouble without seeking the face of the Lord. In our primary text today, Herod was beginning to kill leaders in the church because he saw that it pleased the Jews. And politics is a funny thing. I'll tell you, political leaders do a lot of stuff, and they're doing it not because they have any particular penchant or because they have any particular uh, ideology or beliefs on the subject, but they do it because, hey, this voting block over here is going to support me if I do this. Got news for you, honey. Mr. Trump, half the crapola he's pulling these days, he is pulling... Uh, simply because it helps to line up the religious right behind him like a bunch of mindless zombies. Mm -hmm. And he knows he can lock in that voting block if I do things against the LGBT community, if I do things that looks as though it's going to benefit the pro-life cause. Herod was killing 
Christian leaders and believers because it pleased the Jews. And he found Peter, who of course was probably the premier figure in the Christian church in the first century, and he imprisoned him. And the response of the church was, as the response of the church is today, they began to make placards. They began to pick it outside of Herod's home, his palace. They began to pick it outside of the prison. They began to boycott. No, no, that's not what I read. The Word of God says, no, they turned to prayer. And the church immediately began to pray. Hallelujah. They understood where their help comes from. Amen. The word of God said, my help comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. The maker of heaven and earth. When you understand who God is, you understand why. He is your first recourse and not your last. Mm -hmm. When you know who God is and you know what God is capable of, then you understand why we go to God first. First, I thank God that I grew up in a family. I've talked about this many times. My family was fundamentalist Christians. Uh, they did a lot of things wrong. They had a, wrong, a lot of wrong beliefs. They had a lot of screwball ways, as many of them even do today. But one thing I thank God for, I grew up in a family where when trouble came, the first words off our lips were, we need to pray. We need to pray. I mean to tell you, you let somebody in the family, or you let a friend, or you let a church member find out that they've got cancer. You let a church member be involved in a car accident, or you let somebody uh, be brought to the hospital in an emergency situation. And I'm going to tell you something. The first thing you reached for was not your car keys to run to the hospital. The first thing you reached for was your bedspread so you could get down on your knees beside the bed and begin to pray and seek the face of God. And I'm telling you, they, we would immediately reach for the telephone. And I mean that one family member would get on that phone and call another family member. Uh, Brother Olbar is in the hospital. They're not sure what's going on. We need to pray. They call my mother. And my mother calls somebody else. And somebody calls somebody else. And I mean to tell you, we had prayer going before too long. I mean, we had people all over the country praying. I remember one time my uncle... By marriage, he was suffering with Lou Gehrig's disease. Or, uh, is that right? No, I'm sorry, it's not right. <sighs> I can't think of it off the top of my head, but I, I will after a minute. He was very sick, had been sick for a few years. He had a wife who was under 30 years old. He had uh, four children. The doctors had said that it was... Uh, fatal, that there was no hope of him surviving. He wound up living seven years with it, and the doctor said that it was a miracle, an absolute miracle, that he lived past three years with this condition. One night, I remember coming home, my mother said, CJ, your Uncle Harlan's in the hospital. The doctors have said tonight's the night that there's no hope. He will not leave the hospital. He'll never come out of that hospital again. And I remember going into my bedroom and I remember shutting the door. I was just a kid, about 12, maybe 11, 12, somewhere around there. And I hit my knees and I began to pray for my Uncle Harlan. And I mean, I was crying out to God with all the passion that I could find. And I was weeping and I was praying in the Holy Ghost. And I remember hearing my father come in the house. And my father wasn't a Christian. He was a nasty son of a gun. And you know what? I didn't change anything I was doing because I heard his voice in the background. I still kept praying and shouting and speaking in tongues and praying in the Holy Ghost. And I mean, I couldn't quit because I was so burdened. I didn't want my Uncle Harlan to die at that time. And so I was praying and praying. Well, long story short, that man walked out of the hospital that week and lived yet another couple of years. God answers prayer. 
God answers when we go to Him and we talk to Him and we seek His face. God answers prayer. God can be counted on to keep His word, folks. The problem is too many Christians, not just unbelievers, but too many Christians approach giving God a call. God speaking to His church today in this present circumstance, in this present situation. And He's saying, give me a call. He's telling the church, I've been telling people now for years, ever since Mr. Trump got elected, quit worrying about elections, quit worrying about this and that, and let's get on our knees and talk to God about this thing. That's why when I pray before church and I pray after church, I ask God to intervene on behalf of our nation. And I'm praying every day, God, we need you to intervene on behalf of our nation. Some way, somehow, we've got to get rid of this devilish, demonic, evil leadership that we have right now. And we have got to get our nation back on track or else our democracy will be lost. Our republic will be no more. We'll have a theocracy. We'll have a dictatorship. And Lord, please help us, God. We need you to help us. I'm not getting involved in political action groups. I'm not going out uh, before all this happened and being part of political rallies and all this foolishness. I don't need to do that. I know where my help comes from. I know who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think. I know who is able, as Brother Gillum used to say, I know who's able to do anything I need done better than I could ever do it. I'm going to tell you right now, I believe with all my heart when that fool in Washington got up and said, oh, some people are saying I'm the second coming of God. Oh, honey, you better watch out what you let come off your lips. You better watch out, son. Because all of a sudden, this virus breaks out. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, every gain that we've seen in the stock market since you were elected has been wiped out. All of a sudden, your incompetence and your tomfoolery and your pride and your arrogance is coming to blaring light and it's costing people their lives. See, you can look at this virus as being a curse. I look at it as being something God sent. Amen. I look at it as being an answer to prayer. I've been asking God to intervene on behalf of our country. And you know what? That may be exactly what God has done. Mm -hmm. See, we couldn't do what God has done. We couldn't do what this virus has accomplished in such a short amount of time. And by the time this crisis is over, God willing, Americans, enough Americans will go to the polls and vote in such a way that even with interference from a foreign country, they won't be able to turn the results of this election in a manner that is contrary to the will of the people. I want to tell you today, folks, if we respond to circumstances in our world the way the world responds to these same circumstances, we are going to suffer with the world. The Word of God says, what is it that overcomes the world? Even our faith, our faith overcomes the world. We sing the old song that says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. What does that mean? It means there ain't a thing in the world that can come against us that faith is not able to overcome. Hallelujah. But faith is useless unless faith is Aim toward heaven. Faith is the currency that God's people trade in. You want something from heaven? Don't expect God to send it just to be sending it. No. What we do is we pay Him in essence with faith. Our faith is payment. Faith is the, listen, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That means faith is substantive. It's just like money. 
It's substantive. It is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. So faith is that substantive thing that we offer in response to that, or excuse me, in anticipation of that for which we hope. When you write down your credit card information online and you order something from a company online and you give them all this information and they make a charge against your credit card and you can go right that minute to that credit card site, to that bank site, and you can see, okay, this company has taken that money out of my account. They've already been paid from my credit card, but you haven't gotten your product yet, but you're hoping for the product. You're hoping that they're going to be trustworthy, that they're going to uh, be have integrity, and that that which you have requested in response to this payment, you will receive. That is what faith is, folks. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We give it to God in response or in anticipation, I keep saying in response, in anticipation of that which we hope to receive. Amen? Now you can, play, you can pay thousands of dollars online for something and trust that you'll receive it. And yet we've got Christians today who don't have enough sense to know that when you give God your faith, hallelujah, when you do something, when you offer God faith in anticipation of something, that you can trust Him to deliver. Amen. Amen. We've got people in our world today who call themselves part of the church of the living God, who have more confidence in Amazon than they do in Jehovah. My Lord have mercy. They've got more confidence in Sears than they do in Jesus. <sighs> That's the sad state of affairs for God's people and God is sitting in heaven today in our present circumstance with the coronavirus running loose in our nation and in our world. And God's sitting in heaven and He's saying to the church, Hey, give me a call. Give me a call. Quit looking at me as the last resort and see me as your first resort. I should be the one you come to first. Peter was put in prison and the first response of the church was to fall to their knees and seek the face of God. And you know what's funny? What I always find funny is the Lord delivered Peter miraculously. I'm going to tell you something. God can do miraculous things for you if you'll trust Him. Say, I need groceries. I don't have the supplies in the house that I need. I don't have the money to get the things that I need if we're going to be holed up in the house for a month or so. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Talk to Jesus about it. You'll be shocked what God is able to do. That's right. You'll be shocked at what God is able to do. Go to the Lord about it. Oh, brother, I'm calling this one. I'm calling this agency. I'm calling that agency. I'm making all kinds of calls and asking God, I mean, asking them for help and seeing if they can direct me in the right direction. Uh, why don't you give God a call? See what He's able to do. I'm going to tell you something, folks. See, y'all, some people don't understand how real God is. When you've been around this thing as long as I've been around it, I'm going to tell you, God's so real to me, He's as real as the nose on my face, and i got quite a nose. I've told you before, I remember years ago, Sister Chambers was an elderly saint in a church that I was a part of many, many years ago. I had gone to a hospital here in Dallas from East I was living in East Texas about an hour away. And uh, I'd come here to Dallas to pray for a young man who had been hit by a car. And I was going home, and I didn't have a telephone in my house, and I didn't have a cell phone back then either. And uh, those were some tough days. And I was headed home, and all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, You need to go by Sister Chambers' house. I said, Lord, go by Sister Chambers' house. It was like 10 o'clock at night. And Sister Chambers was... Asleep in bed by 8 o'clock every night. I mean, bless her heart. She was in her 80s, you know. She was up there in age. And she was in bed by 8 o'clock. And she and I were very close. And uh, I loved her just like a grandma, you know. She was such a marvelous, marvelous 
Holy Ghost filled saint of God like nothing you've ever seen. And the Spirit of the Lord kept pushing me. You need to go by Sister Chambers' house. You need to go by Sister Chambers' house. I said, Lord, why in the world am I feeling this unction to go by Sister Chambers' house? I don't understand. So I said, well, I'll make a pass by and see if I happen to see any lights on or anything. And Tommy, I drove. I'm driving down the road by her house. I slow down as I'm going past her house and I'm looking. And there's Sister Chambers on the front porch going like this, trying to see. Because she had her porch light on, you know, and she's trying to see. And I pulled in her driveway. And I got out of the car, and God forgive me, I probably wasn't very smart, but I used to teasingly call her old lady. And I got out of the car, I said, old lady, what are you doing out here on this patio, on this porch? She said, oh, thank you, Jesus. She said, I told the Lord to tell you to come by. I said, you did? She said, yes. She said, I knew you didn't have a telephone. There was no way for me to reach you. There's been a, a situation that I needed to talk to you about. She said, I told the Lord to tell you to come by. Folks, that's how real God can be. You don't know how real God is can be. I've had people come up to me and hand me checks or hand me cash for exactly the amount of money, not a penny more, not a penny less, exactly the amount of money I needed to pay my rent or to pay a bill, and I hadn't told a soul in the universe that I needed that money. I'd only talk to the Lord about it. And that person turned around and handed me and said, the Lord told me to give this to you. I'm going to tell you something. God will be a lot realer to you if you'll treat him like he's real. Amen. If Amen. you'll exercise the little faith, if you'll step out, if you'll give him a call, get on the phone. We sing the old song, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. Jesus on the main line now. Amen. His line is never busy. Tell him what you want. The Word of God declares today in Psalm chapter... Better put on my glasses or I'll be directing you falsely. Psalm chapter 50 and verse 15. The Word of God declares, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Me. Hallelujah. There's a promise you can take to the bank. God said, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. I will deliver thee. And what does he seek? What does he desire in response? Merely that we would give him the glory. Amen. That's why I've Tommy, who grew up Jehovah's Witness, I've had to train him and teach him how to do things right. When a blessing comes your way, small or big, the first reaction, the first response ought always to be what? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I was watching a television program just last night that was... Uh, about people who have lost family members and, uh, you know, maybe they were adopted as children and they're trying to find their lost parent, you know. Uh, and this one man uh, had employed the television program to help him. And the lady came to his house. She said, I have an update. I have news for you. He said, really? She said, yes. She said, we found your daughter. And he began to weep. And as he was weeping, he was saying... Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Do you remember that? <laughs> and I, even now, I've got goosebumps because that's exactly the reaction he should have had. Amen. When God answers prayer, all he asks of us is to give him credit for having answered prayer. That's all he asks. Give me credit. Give credit where credit is due. So when a blessing comes or when God answers prayer, immediately we ought to offer unto the Lord the fruit of our lips and glorify Him. In Psalm chapter 86 and verse 7, the Word of God declares, In the day of trouble I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In 2 Chronicles 32, 7 through 8, 
The word of the Lord says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. The Assyrians, the king of Assyria, had come against uh, the people of God. And this is what the Spirit of the Lord was telling uh, the leadership in Israel. For there be more with us than with them. Now that's not the way it looked. It looked like the Assyrians outnumbered the people of God. And yet, the Spirit of God says, no, there be more with us than with them. Honey, i got news for you. God's got resources you don't know anything about. Amen. Now listen to this next phrase. Verse 8, 2 Chronicles 32. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Hallelujah. Oh, Hezekiah by the Holy Ghost declared to the people of Judah, with all the king of Assyria has is an arm of flesh. All he has is an arm of flesh. Why are you running around trying to find a way out of your dilemma? Trying to find a way out of your problem? Why are you trying to rely on arm of flesh. Don't you understand? We've got a whole lot more going for us than he's ever got going for him. My God, we have. Listen to the way Hezekiah said it. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Hallelujah. Oh, when you know who God is, when you know what God is capable of, then, honey, you know that the first call you need to make when trouble comes, the first call you ought to be making today with this coronavirus, the first call you ought to be making today with Donald Trump in the White House, the first call you ought to be making today with the wickedness and the evil going on in the GOP, the first call you need to be making today isn't to the DNC. The first call you need to be making today isn't to this political activist group. The first thing you need to be doing today is not donating to this candidate or donating to that candidate. Now, I'm not saying those things are bad or wrong, but that's not the first thing you ought to be doing. The first thing you ought to be doing is giving God a call. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 16, we read about Paul and Silas in prison. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Oh, thank God they didn't gripe and complain and moan and groan. Thank God they didn't tell the jailer outside the door how they had been mistreated and how things weren't being done right and how they should be free to exercise their religion. No, even in the worst of circumstances, Paul and Silas knew their help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and of earth. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. I told you God's able to do better and faster and easier. Anything needs to be done. Amen. There isn't anything... That needs to be done that God can't do better than we could ever dream of doing it. Amen. If we'll just go to God first. Amen. Amen. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks. I want you to understand this truth. This is so important. 
we're in a circumstance and in a situation in our world today where it's going to be awful easy to fall back on the arm of flesh. It's going to be easy to try to trust human beings to help us out of our dilemma. But here is an opportunity for revival. When this virus is done, when it has run its course and we're able to return to a, a regular way of life, there should be an opportunity right now for revival to break out in America like we've never seen before. Because during this time, all of the church of the living God should have been driven to our knees. See, I'm going to tell you, uh, God has a way, if you don't know how to pray, God has a way of helping you to pray. If you don't know to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and get on your knees and talk to Him about some things, God has a way of helping you find your way to your knees. And right now, the circumstance in our nation... This is a perfect opportunity. We can look at it as negatively as we want to. I'm going to tell you, I look at it pretty positively because I'm seeing this as an opportunity for every member of the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of, uh, uh, of truth. There is an opportunity now for every person in the church of God to fall to their knees and seek the face of God. And to let the Lord know that above all else, the most important thing in the world to us is the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Hallelujah. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Lastly, today the Word of God declares in James chapter 5, 13 through 15, Is any among you afflicted? Let him complain. Is any among you afflicted? Let him gripe and whine. Let him cry. Let him weep. No, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. What is the first response of God's people to affliction? Give me a call. What is the first response of the people of God to sickness? Give me a call. What is the response, the first response of the people of God to trouble and dilemmas and trials? Give me a call. Hallelujah. Oh, God is not our last resort today, saints. He is our hope. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Hallelujah. The name of the Lord is a mighty tower. The righteous run therein and are saved. Hallelujah. I want to tell you today, children of God, it's time to give God a call. It's time to pray. It's time to seek the face of the Lord. There's an opportunity in this situation for God's people to experience God like we've never experienced God before. There's an opportunity today for God's people to experience revival. Come on, saints, let's get on our knees and let's begin to pray in a move of God when all this mess is over. Let's pray in a revival. Let's pray in a move of God. Let's pray in a mighty sweeping move of the Holy Ghost that will touch our nation. And it was all brought about because a circumstance, a situation drove the people of God to their knees. Because we know that the first response of every child of God to every dilemma is give me a call. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.